Thanks. Uh, so a couple things. First of all, how many people are engineers or non-salesmen, technical? OK, let's try the other way. Who's not technical? OK, just a couple. Good. Uh, then just also, I'd like you to do something for me. If you were to suddenly, I give you magic powers and you can now sell, I want you to think about what you would want to sell. What is it you would, you would suddenly, if you were able to sell, what would it be? So I want you to just sort of think that through right now, and maybe I'll just point to a few people and you can just say, so I get some idea of what people are thinking about when we talk about what does it take to sell. So what would you sell? Well, first of all, we are approaching the summertime. Yep. So the first time I would sell would definitely be a night out with an engineer, some lovely girl. OK. And then, uh, I so sell a woman. OK. <laughs> Or sell yourself to a woman, but you're always selling yourself, so that's cool. Okay, how about you? What would you sell? Or what do you think about when you sell? An idea. What would be the idea? What would you? Suddenly, I'm going to give you superpowers to sell. What are you going to use those powers for over the next year? What do you think you'd like to sell? How would it help you in your work? How would it help you in your dreams? How would it help you in your personal life? What is it you want? out of selling. If I gave you that superpower, what are you going to use it for in the next year? So what idea? How an idea? Tell me more. Don't be afraid. No, I'm not afraid, but I wouldn't like to open a discussion about politics right now. Okay. <laughs> so you'd like to do some sort of political uh, revolution, let's call it. Societal, let's yeah, societal revolution. Cool. Okay. So you want to sell mass number of normal people. Uh, some volunteers? Before I just start picking around? I, I would like to be really passionate about what I'm doing. So I would sell something about surfing, like an application for surfing. An application for surfing. Cool. OK. What else? Uh, how about you? The necessity of reform. The necessity of reform. Reforming what? Everything. So politics again. <laughs> really? You guys are going to waste great sales skill on politics? This is one of the ultimate black holes. Uh, sorry? What, was your, what is your product? Or what would your product be? For film crews. Yes. Cool. Excellent. Uh, just, let's just try. So how many people would want to sell something big? And how, let's, let's just start out with, who wants to sell big things? Big is an expensive? Or big is an expensive, complex, a limited number. Who wants to sell small things? Lots and lots of little ones. Wrigley's chewing gum, uh, Gmail, all that kind of stuff. OK. So roughly an equal balance. OK, good. Um, good. So. I, I'll just start a little bit about myself. So I actually have a master's degree in electrical engineering. And I, as I said, I always think of myself as an engineer. And a few things changed this for me. Uh, so one was I was uh, head of engineering for a division of Honeywell. And we were, before we got bought by Honeywell, we had big cash flow problems. And since actually it's a very technical group, so I'll explain what we were doing. We were measuring steel. So we were using x-rays, shooting it through uh, when you make uh, rolled steel. You shoot x-rays through it. And the amount of x-rays that get to the other side is inversely proportionate to how much steel there is. So you know the steel is going by at 100 kilometers an hour, full of lubricants and coolants and everything else. And you can measure very precisely doing this. So the equipment costs between 50000 to a $1 million. And the big buyers all through the late 90s were in Asia. So I was spending lots of time shipping stuff. But we had problems shipping things because we got paid only after we ship. And one of the things, if anybody's in the startup world, manufacturing sucks because you typically have to buy the parts before you get paid for the parts. So the more you sell and the more you grow, the worse the problem gets. So we were shipping things before they were ready. I know, engineering, we'd never do that. But unfortunately, there's business requirements. So I was going to, in a steel factory, they lose $60,000 an hour. 
$60,000 an hour. And our equipment wasn't running for typically two weeks, more than two weeks. So you can imagine we had some very, very upset customers. They're losing $60,000 an hour for two weeks straight. Now, part of it was they anticipated some startup delays, but that was ridiculous. So by the time I got on site, we'd already sent the local Asian technicians, the factory technicians, engineers from my team, tech leads from my team, and now I was head of engineering showing up on site. And what I suddenly realized is there is no way that this customer is ever going to let me fix it. They are in such pain, they are so angry, they are so out of their mind upset that they are just going to find a million problems. They're just going to go into this mode that they'll always find one more problem. I don't know if you've ever seen this kind of situation. Certainly with your wife you can, or husband, you find that situation where you've just gotten into it and you just go, there's just no way this argument can be about what this argument is about. And so the first thing I realized is I had to get this customer. This customer was self-destructive. And my number one job was not to fix the technical problems, but was to cool down this customer enough that he could help us solve the problem. Because at some point, you need the customer to help you solve the problem, not just, damn it, fix it. Second thing that happened to me while I was doing this is we were doing measurements. And we had two different divisions. One division was doing, uh, I can move a little bit. One division was doing the, the low-end stuff. One division was doing the high-end equipment. The difference between high-end and low-end was how fast the measurement was. So it was one millisecond for the expensive stuff. It was 15 milliseconds for the slow stuff. And I'd grown up through the ranks coming from the slow stuff. And I remember I was there, at, and we were looking to increase our next generation. We had the fastest at, at 0 0.8 milliseconds, and we were thinking we wanted to get to 100 microseconds. And at the time, we were using quite some technology to do this, and we were pretty excited about it, that we were going to blow away the industry with 100 microsecond next generation. And we started, uh, I was there, and I'm talking, I've got some low-end equipment, and I was asking the guy who was doing the control system from ABB, and I said, how fast are you reading my analog input? And he said, well, 10,000 times a second. I said, oh, okay, that makes sense. I said, that's amazing. Your control loop runs 10,000 times a second? He goes, oh, no, my control loop is, uh, is 100 milliseconds. That's 10 times a second. He goes, what? And he goes, and in fact, the rollers that I'm controlling, they have a response time of about one second. What's going on here? Why do you need, why do you need one millisecond or half of one millisecond why are you reading it so fast? Well, I want to read extra time so I can average it out and remove any noise. Now, I want to give you some idea of what we were doing to, to make this, this high precision. The high, the high speed measurement, we were having to use unstable materials that were hygroscopic, meaning the water attracted them and got destroyed. They were sensitive to vibration. They were temperature sensitive, so they had to have thermoelectric heat pumps and coolers in there. We had to do all of these crazy things to go from 10 milliseconds to 1 milliseconds, and 10 milliseconds was more than fast enough. What happened? And I started going back and checking out with our sales guys. No, 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 the customers definitely want fast. And I started talking to a couple of the people that were buying the equipment, and they all wanted the next generation fast one. They were really excited. And it took me a while, it took me about six months to figure out that nobody needed it. Everybody wanted it, nobody needed it. We just crossed the megapixel war. So suddenly there was this aha moment that the whole industry was going off in some crazy direction. And so the third thing that sort of came out of this is my mother was actually a, 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 psychi a nurse in a psychiatric hospital. So I'd read a lot about psychology and uh, it was sort of a hobby of mine. So what I realized was that in the case of making this, this measurement equipment that we had customers who were asking for faster, and we had salesmen saying, we got the fastest. And the two of them were driving us as engineers into designing stupidity. Now, we were doing a great job designing that stupidity. You know, 100 milliseconds, signal processors, optimized code, you know, all kinds of exotic materials to try and make the thing go. But why were we doing it? We were doing it for stupid reasons. So that's, that's what got me into the area of of sales and marketing, where I realized that fundamentally our customers don't know what they need and the salesmen don't know how to help find them. 
help find what they need. So that's my fundamental premise all my career, and it's so far pretty much proven to be right, which is customers don't know what they need. And I started to make the transition over into the, 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 the sales area. So um, I want to do another sort of example. And uh, so let's imagine that suddenly I discover I have a relative who dies that I didn't know about, and suddenly I get a big area of land with uh, grape, grapes on it, and I'm going to do the Slovene thing, and I'm going to make really average quality but crazy expensive wine. <laughs> I can do that. So I need to, the first thing I need to do is get a tractor, because I'm not going to go out there with a shovel. You know, I like the idea of expensive wine, but I don't like the idea of, of real work. So I'm going to go to, I don't know, Dom Jale or wherever they sell tractors, and I'm going to walk into the store, and the person's going to walk up. No, someone will I mean, would you guys do any different? So we're going to walk around. I'm going to walk around. I'm going to take a look at this one, and woo, this one, and this one, and this one. At some point, the salesman is going to re-engage with me. What am I going to ask him? Guess. What am I going to ask him? What's the most obvious thing I would ask? This tractor, what do I want to know? How much? How much? What else do I want to know? Which one is the best? Uh, the yeah, is it diesel? Is this benzene? Is it four-wheel drive? How many horsepower? You know, what kind of four-wheel drive is this? Is it Enox? Is it regular steel? Where is it made? Does it have the power takeoff, extra cool accessories? All this sort of thing. Is it injected, computer controlled. I want to know technical details and I want to know price. And the guy's going to respond and he's going to tell me, oh, this one, this one's a great model, really great price. It's, uh, it's a diesel like you, like great diesel. It's only two-wheel drive, but it runs great. Uh-huh. For that price, it's only two-wheel drive. Yeah. And this one over here, here's a four-wheel drive. And it is, uh, you know, super performance. But again, this one's actually benzene, but you're going to get great performance out of this one. For that price, I'm going to get a benzene engine. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, they're a bit expensive. He goes, well, maybe we can do something on the price. Would you like me to make a formal offer? Yeah. So we'll go back into his office, and he'll prepare two formal offers, as we do here in Slovenia, and I'll have my two tractors. And he'll be telling me that there's some super atzia, and this one's 10% off, and this one's 15% off. And I'm going to have to go back, and what am I going to do? I'm going to think about it, aren't I? So I'm going to walk out and think about it, and the sales manager is going to go to the salesman and say, that American guy, is he going to buy a tractor? Seriously. Yeah, absolutely. He just got the land. Uh-huh. Did you tell him about the atzia? Why didn't you close the deal? Well, you know, boss, the problem is we don't have enough good diesel four-wheel drives at the right price. Right? Because as far as he was concerned, that was my objection. I said I wanted diesel, I wanted four-wheel drive, and I wanted that price. That's what he heard. That's what the two offers reflected. The question is, was he right? No. How did that happen? How did it, in the salesman mind, did it become that I, and how did, how did I walk out of there? I bet I walked out of there with my two offers thinking, wow, i really like to get a diesel four-wheel drive at, a, you know, at the, the 10,000 euro price, right? How did that happen? I don't know the first damn thing about tractors. And that salesman doesn't know the first damn thing about me. How did we get into this spiral of negotiating what price a diesel four-wheel drive tractor should be? That's ridiculous. And it happens because salesmen and customers conspire to waste each other's time. That conversation was a total waste of time. We didn't need to have that. It has nothing to do with anything. I don't even know if I need a tractor, to be honest with you. So I'm talking about this because where we normally get into problems with, with engineers who want to sell, you know, this group is probably one of the least likely to succeed at selling of anybody. I can take a group of secretaries and it's probably going to be easier to make the jump. And the question is why? And it's the same reason why magicians love engineers. You know that, that the magicians find engineers and scientists are the easiest ones to fool. And the reason is, is because you're looking linear. You have an expectation, the expectation's realized, 
and there you go for it. While somebody who doesn't know anything, they know they don't know anything. And they sit back and they watch and they listen. And that's the, the, fund, the number one fundamental problem. Why, why engineers are terrible at taking apart magic tricks, even though they desperately, and I desperately love doing it, we're no good at it. And number two is why we can't sell. So if you can sell, you're wickedly powerful because you have two things, but it's one of the hardest things to do. So I want to start with, uh, so one more thing. If I say something that just doesn't seem right, I want you guys to challenge me. You know, uh, my Slovene is terrible. My English is much better, but I do speak both engineering and sales. And there's not many people that can, can cross over and, and see if we can do this. Because normally, when you talk, why, why is sales so difficult? And one of the reasons for engineers is, is because even the salesmen who are good at it don't know why they're good at it. They can't explain it. And since they can't explain it to you, it's not real, is it? First rule of engineering. If you can't map out the process, it doesn't exist. But it does exist. There is a difference. There are salesmen who are perpetually, quote unquote, lucky. I think one of the great ones I had, uh, I did a review of one of my salesmen and got feedback from the engineers. And they said, well, I don't know exactly what John does, but the customers seem to love him and we get a ton of business. That's a wild compliment for a salesman. And the funny thing is, if you ask John what he does, he says, well, I just go in and do it. Well, but what's your process? What are you looking for? Well, I don't know, Matt. I just go in and I sell. So most salesmen have learned by imitating somebody else. And most engineers, what they've seen, they don't understand. It's completely nothing or magic or luck. So this is why, how hard could this possibly be? You just walk up and be lucky, right? So, and if I think about this, as engineers, how hard would it be to do finance? How many weeks would you need to spend with an ERP software where you could do mostly what your accountants can do? Two, three, one? It wouldn't take very long at all because they have a very linear process-driven job. You have the tool set, you could do it. Even legal. There's all kinds of stuff available online. The legal is almost mathematics in the way that it all comes together. It's not so damn hard. What other jobs could we do? We're smart guys. What else? Manufacturing, purchasing. How hard could purchasing be? What else could we be? I'll tell you what you can't be, salesmen. And the reason is you don't understand what they're doing and you're not tuned to think that way. We're a bit autistic. So one of the other things you see with your, when, you're, when you're an engineer, how do we train for a problem, right? The, the professor puts up something and the optimal solution is using the least number of gates or using the least number of lines of code. And people are raising their hand saying, I know what it is. So it's the first person to get the optimal solution, right? That's what, for me at least, that's what engineering school was about. So you guys are real engineers. Is there an optimal solution? Is there one optimal solution ever? Never. Never. Why? Because you have maintainability. You have to design for the future, but you don't know what the future is. There's testability. There's also practicality. How much time do you want to waste to get 2% better? There's good enough, right? So there is no optimal. And I remember this being a big shock as I went into real engineering. Well. It's also true in lots of things, but we've been tuned to look for the optimal solution as early as possible. From a customer perspective, one of the biggest problems is, I don't know what I need yet. And here you are, I've got the answer. I have the, the answer. There is no other answer, I've already got it, and you haven't even finished your second sentence. Nobody wants to hear that. I didn't want to hear it from the tractor salesman, and I sure didn't want to hear it from anything else. So this is, this is where things start to go wild. Um, good. Um, let's, uh, let's start with, though, let's, I'm getting a little bit ahead. Let's start with, wow, generous, one pen. Um, <laughs> the, uh, let's start with uh, uh, types of selling. Can you guys name some types of selling? Transactional selling? Transactional selling? Okay, yeah, sure. Upselling, cross-selling? 
Consultative? What do you mean by consultative? What do you mean by consultative? Who answered, who said that? <laughs> Nobody? Okay. What other kinds of selling? I'll have to go back to that one. Direct, indirect, yep. Influence selling, okay. Products versus services, great. What else? Okay, yeah. What about if I wanted to sell chewing gum? You know, it's sitting there right by the Blagina. What's that? What, what kind of selling is that? Transactions? Impulsive, yeah. How do you sell to the government? I didn't say how it was really sold. How do they think, they, how do they think it's sold? Yeah, bid and tender, right? How about, uh, how do they sell at Ikea? They don't, do they? Right? They just have, uh, they just have, uh, it's uh, order taking, right? You just come up to the Blagina. It's a mess. Um, Okay, what I wanted to do is, is, I often think about the world and I break it into four. So if I think about direct and indirect, at the end of the day, somebody is still selling, right? So it's that indirect versus direct is just who sells, not how we sell. And if I think about transactional, I bring that down to more like impulsive or... That's sort of order taking, right? So you've got order taking, which is what do you want? Amazon is order taking. Uh, Ikea is order taking or just straight checkout, right? Customer says what they want and they give you the price. There's no more customer says, I want to know the specifications on this replacement battery and here's the specifications on the replacement battery. You want to know what people think? Here's the data of what people think. Unfiltered. Just here it is, you make your own decision. Nobody's trying to help you buy, they're just trying to give you everything you ask for. Right, agreed? So, bid and tender is kind of a funny category because it sort of is, instead of, instead of, it, instead of the buying-selling process being an iterative model, it's a waterfall model. Right, it's just, we make all the specifications and then there's a, a single offer to buy one time, one cycle, done. It's not surprising why it's not very efficient, right? It's, it's completely the least agile, the least learning of all the different buying, buying, selling processes. Impulsive. What's the difference between getting you to buy Wrigley's chewing gum and getting you to invest in a cargo ship? Business opportunity. Would you need to explain to your wife why you just dumped 30,000 euros and your life savings and borrowed 10 to make it happen to do the, 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 the ship, a small share of a ship? You wouldn't have a wife anymore. <laughs> Quite possibly. No, so, so one of the things that starts to happen is more people are involved in the decision. Right? So as it gets bigger and it gets more complex, there's more people involved in the decision. Are all people involved in a decision equal? Do they just vote? No. What's the differences there? You got decision makers. What's a non-decision maker do? Yep. So we got decision makers, non-decision makers. There's one more. This is somebody who can say no but can't say yes. Right? So uh, there was a great one like uh, Sony PlayStation. You know, they put the, the Blu-ray player 
And one of the things is they did the market research and found that most men need to justify why they spend, if they spend more than $300, they need to justify it to their wife. And the, so the wife can say no, but she's not the decision maker, right? She can't say yes, but she can say no. And so they put that in there so that men could come back and say, good news, honey, I just bought a movie player for the family. And it has game controllers. <laughs> so, so impulsive selling chewing gum is wildly different than selling something big and complex. Impulsive is just about getting you in an emotional moment for a fraction of a second or one minute or two minutes. This is what they're trying to do. This is what Studio Moderna is often trying to do. It's trying to get an emotional response that's not going to last very long. Most of us here, we're probably going to be doing longer-term selling, especially if we're doing big B2B technology sales, things like this. This is large, complex, consultative. And I wanted somebody to say that. This is, this is the tractor. Nobody buys a tractor like the piece of chewing gum. There is no way you're going to get me to have that funny, well, I'll, yeah, I'll take that tractor with the benzene engine. That sounds good. Wrap it up. Yeah, throw it in the bag. So, uh, so what we want to do is, so I want to just, impulsive, impulsive is selling Pepsi, and beer, selling Wrigley's chewing gum, lots of little stuff. And to be honest with you, this is marketing. This is psychology. And I don't see much noble purpose in this. I mean, this is not, I wouldn't have left engineering to do that. Right? This is just to make money. People who do this sell this to make money, not because they have some bigger reason. Uh, bid and tender, as somebody pointed out, bid and tender, the deal's closed before the bid is submitted, right? before the res piece is published. The deal is cooked for somebody. And it can be a dirty cooking or it can be a clean cooking because what would happen if you did a res piece with no information, zero? I mean, we actually know this. There's examples of this where the U.S. military needs to buy toilet seats for a submarine. But they can't just say, please get me a 20-euro toilet seat from Bauhaus. Instead, what they have to do is to make a fair tender. They have to describe the dimensions of it. And they can't say what the materials is because that would favor one. So what they have to do is have pass how it will be tested. And it turns out that probably only three companies in the world could even figure out who could make it, and you ended up with 500 euro toilet seats, right? This is what happens if, so even in bid and tender, we want them, they need to get educated. So at the very least, they're educated. At the very most, they've been bought off, right? So somewhere in between. So bid and tender, the actual bid and tender is not that interesting because all the interesting stuff happened before when you were trying to educate the customer. And Lagina sales, this is about just taking an order. You don't need geniuses for this. I mean, the people who work at McDonald's don't have to spend large amounts of training. The customer tells you what you want. This is why the web has been fantastic. If I want an MP3 player, it's easier to buy online than to talk to somebody who doesn't know anything. So what's really here, and what's really the most interesting is what I would refer to as consultative selling. And the interesting thing about this particular category is you can apply it to almost anything. And it's the area where uh, it's the most difficult to, to, to close a deal. So direct versus indirect. Let's talk a little bit about that. What's the difference from a company perspective? I want to sell my product. What's the difference between direct and indirect? Intermediary. What do I gain? What do I lose? When I choose indirect sales, what do I gain and what do I lose? Feedback and information. That's two really key things that people don't think about when they do indirect sales channel. Indirect sales channel says, please make, bring me business. And if the recipe for selling is not perfect, 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 you get back zero. You get back near zero and you spend a lot of time and energy. And that's one of the, the, the big key problems. So this brings up one of the bad news, guys. You can't outsource sales, especially if it's a new product. 
You have to do it yourself. I was, my father was in town, and he was asking, why do engineers want to sell? They don't. But here's the reality. Most engineers want to change the world. We want to build something. We want to do something cool. And once we do something cool, we want to keep doing it. We want it to get to the world. We don't want to just do the design and throw it in the garbage. So if you take a look at, say, software companies, mature software companies, what percentage of their costs is engineering? If it's a startup, maybe about 50%. If it's a mature, successful company, between 15 and 35. What's the cost of selling? 50% in nearly all cases. Take a look at annual reports. So, if you've got this great idea how you want to change the world, the first thing you need to do is be great at selling and good at engineering. Because the reverse won't get you there. And that's why, hopefully, you guys are forward enough thinking to be sort of planting that seed. You have to actually learn how to sell. And you can't outsource it. You can't, uh, you've got to actually get in and do it. If you've got the brilliant idea, it's you. So if you've got a co-founder and he's sharing the same uh, belief and you have total, total trust, yeah, then you're okay. But you still need to know what he's doing. It's a bit like having an accountant for a wife. Uh, it's all cool till you take the holiday. You shouldn't have. Um, okay, so... Uh, okay, so... So we're talking about selling. So I'm going to talk to my customer. Uh, and if we do complex consultative selling, one of the things, the rules of complex consultative selling is somebody has to justify why they chose something. They have to justify it to themselves. They need to explain it to others. They may even need to get other people to buy it in. I need my wife not to harass me for the next two weeks because I bought a PlayStation gaming console. So uh, we need multiple people. And do those multiple people think exactly alike? No. So how many of you have said, well, what does the customer think? Why does the, what, which one does the customer like? Will the customer buy us? Is the customer one person? In most cases, no. If I'm trying to sell a couch... If I'm trying to sell a Natuzzi couch, there's at least two that are involved. And both people have different opinions. So when we talk about what does the customer think, that's a very complex question. The customer doesn't say yes. The customer's people all have to come to a consensus of yes. And they're different people with different priorities, different approach to the problem, and different weights, right? They can be just influencers, time wasters, uh, vetoes, or positive, you know, vote casting decision makers. And all of that's in there. Now, let's just kind of think through uh, the type of people. Actually, no, let me do one more thing. So, the, the other thing that, that gets us into a little bit of trouble as engineers is we're also very autistic in the sense that we Everything we do has a number, right? There is a correct number for what we do. Everything is digital in an engineering space. You have an answer, a clear answer. And that answer is absolute, right? Numbers are absolute. If you're in the legal profession, is it absolute? Things are both absolute and relative. Even in accounting, they're absolute and relative, right? What's tax evasion depends on the context of the transaction, not just the transaction itself. Same thing with legal. But in engineering, it works, it doesn't work. It does this to the number six or it doesn't do this to the number six. It's not relative. When we talk about selling and somebody buys, is that absolute or is that relative? Do you guys not, not understand what I mean by relative, right? So, so relative would be, uh, let's think of, of an example. So I think your product is great. It's great value for money. That's an absolute statement. It's better value for money than your competition. That's a relative statement, right? Because it's relative to something else. 
And so it depends on what I put as the competition. So it's good compared to what I'm thinking about in my head. What am I thinking about in my head? You don't know. So it's good today. It's not good tomorrow. It's really good the day after. And it's not good the day after that. Why? Because my relative point, my point of reference that I'm comparing it to is changing. This doesn't happen in engineering, but this happens in other places. And this is, again, why engineers get into trouble, because what you're thinking about is you're thinking about the absolute indications. I gave him the thing. It did this performance, these features, this specification. He loved it yesterday. I don't understand. And what you don't understand is the thing I'm comparing it to in my mind changed. And because I don't ask the questions and because the customer didn't tell you, you just got confused. You decided this customer is an idiot. And I'm going to have to use some manipulative trick to get him through. Anybody had that situation? OK. Um, so relative versus absolute, that's the other key area. So there is no single solution. You definitely don't. There is, no, there is no reward for coming up with a solution first. In fact, there's all kinds of penalties for coming up with it first. And the judgment, buy, not buy, is always relative, not, uh, is usually relative to something that you don't know, that you need to discover, and not something that's absolutely fixed. OK. Um, so what I want to talk a little bit about now is, if we think about multi-person selling, so Xerox, in Silicon Valley, there are a couple great companies that are, all of them are no longer great, but they were great at their days. So one was Hewlett Packard. All the great engineering managers came out of Hewlett Packard. They spent huge amounts of time figuring out how to manage engineering. And then there were Xerox. You probably don't even know Xerox, but Xerox spent huge amounts of time trying to figure out the process of selling, selling things, trying to, trying to break down the magic that salesmen do into a process and trying to really study it and analyze it and teach it and proliferate it. So in terms of selling technology, Xerox was a powerhouse. I mean, they just made damn copiers. How did they end up as such a giant? It was great, great selling. Decent product, great selling. And by the way, Think about this. If you had a great product but junk selling, or great selling and a junk product, or great selling and an OK product, which one's going to win? Right? Great selling and an OK product will outperform fantastic products with shit sales. So you can't, you know, you can't polish a turd and compensate for that, but you can, uh, but selling will make the difference. So one of the things Xerox figured out when they were doing complex consultative, because at the time they were doing this, a Xerox machine was rather expensive, is you ended up with three different buying groups. You ended up with a technical buyer. Technical buyer is not just an engineer or a uh, IT guy, but it's also a lawyer or a purchasing manager. Somebody who worries about details, right? That's the technical buyer. He's worried about technicalities. There's another buyer called the user buyer. The user buyer is who has to live with the results of whatever has been purchased. So this is in the living room. The whole family has to live with this ugly thing in the living room. And that's going to be the wife, if we talk about the Sony PlayStation. And the third is the financial buyer. Financial buyer is not what you think it is. The financial buyer is the person that has to deal with unrelated value for money purchases. So this is the person that's deciding, should I put new Klima systems in the building? Should I hire a new salesman for the German market? Should I change the carpeting and the couches in the reception area? All three of these things are good for my company. All three of these things we could argue are going to our investments but I don't have enough cash to do all three, right? So I want you to think about that, right? So who's the competition for the guy trying to sell the Klima? Is it another Klima salesman? No. It's a salesman in Germany. 
You know, should we hire a salesman in Germany or it's carpets in the lobby? Some completely unrelated value for money. How does a person like that, who is a person like that? It's often a CEO, an owner, a division manager in a company. In a person, in a, in a family, it's usually the person who has to, who actually knows how much money is in the bank account. Right? In every relationship, every family, there's typically only one who really knows how much money is in the bank account. So the financial buyer is the one that's comparing unrelated items. Now, what is a budget? When somebody makes a budget at the beginning of the year, how did they know how much to reserve for Klimas and how much to reserve for a salesman? Anybody ever involved in a budget? Okay, so a couple. When you do a budget, somebody says, Klima should cost this much, and a salesman should cost this much. So value for money, the financial buyer has decided that Klimas are worth 4,000 euros. What if I've got some super mega fantastic Klima that costs three times as much but would pay for itself in nine months? That's a problem, right? Why? Because the financial buyer has already decided what goes in there. So, technical buyer, we're technical people. So who do we talk to when we go to sell? If you wanted to sell the Triglau, you have this great product for helping insurance companies re avoid uh, criminals. Who are you going to talk to? Sorry? You've got, you've got, uh, you've got, you've got this great software that's going to help you find criminals. Who is it we're going to talk to? You're going to go in and... You could. You could. Are they going to understand what you're trying to do? Maybe. Maybe. Because, no, it's not their job. They don't deal with criminals that much. But they might. They're getting screwed by criminals, but they don't deal with them a lot, right? You know who's going to want to talk to you? And do you know who that, that person who's the, the actuarial, do you know who he's going to send you to? The IT department. Right? Because they're the ones who understand software. Right? Anybody gone on a sales trip and had that, had that happen to them? Yeah. Right? You're going to go to the IT guys because the IT guys know that. Now, the question is, the IT guys love your stuff. They thought it was fantastic how you mixed Microsoft.net on a Linux compiler <laughs> and, uh, and did 63-bit processing not the classic 64, and thought this was absolutely fantastic and that your price is okay and that you're going to win this deal. Is the technical buyer usually the main decision maker? Sorry to say this, guys. No. Why? It's because the main competition is, do I get a clima or do I get carpeting in the front? I'm not looking for the guy to figure... I'm looking for the guy, the, the guy who can understand the clima to tell me that this one's not bad. But I'm not looking for him to tell me whether I should be buying carpets or climas or whether I should spend 20000 or 10000 on a clima. Instead, technical buyers typically can only say no. Do they know that they can only say no? No, they don't. In fact, does this guy want to talk to you? You're a salesman selling software. The owner of the company, the managing director of, the, of Generali, does he want to talk to you? No, he does not. He already has seven pages of things he's supposed to buy, and the last thing in the world he wants to do is hear why he needs to spend even more money on something else. He wants to first have you go through the gauntlet of the other guys, and maybe he'll talk to you later, right? So, what's he going to tell the technical guy? Hey, these guys sent me an email for this great software. Can you go take a look at it? And what? Tell me whether I should buy it. Right? They're going to tell him. So he already thinks he should be the person to make the decision, and now he's just been told he's the expert and the one that should make the decision. So... When you go and reach this guy, is he going to let you talk to this guy? Is he going to let you talk to anybody else in the company? Nope. You're locked out. 
But good news, he loves you. And you know what happens when you lose? You're going to pick him up and say, and he's going to be crying on the phone with you saying, I don't know why somebody must have just passed a blue envelope. Because he can't figure out anything. So this is where technical people, as soon as you mention anything technical, where do you get sent? You get sent to the technical buyer. Is the technical buyer the guy that can actually describe the business problem and make the decision? No. He cannot say yes. He can only say no. So you as an engineer, the instant you say something, like you go to the actuarial, and you say anything that sounds technical, you get sent to technical buyer purgatory, and you're out. Look, you don't think every managing director has got four people a day calling them, with, telling them that they could save so much money on buying this or buying this or investing in this. They got 20 pages of this crap. I mean, there's so much stuff that would, be, that would save money and generate more money. They don't have the bandwidth to do it all. They don't have the cash flow to do it. They've got page one and a lot of other pages. That's kind of the rule of... of of big B2B selling. You have page one and all the other pages. And if it's a bad economy, you have the first two lines and all the other pages. So. Maybe you just say, say uh, sorry, are you hot now? <laughs> are you hot now? I might I be hot. hot. Yeah. Yeah. You might be, you know. So, you know what's great is if you're selling climas and that's your conversation, you're able to talk to this guy. He's not going to send you over here. But as soon as you start talking about how you do multi-zone temperature compensation to reduce total efficiency through an optimized uh, self-learning machine, that guy. And he loves you. He's waiting for you. He wants to get all the specifications. He wants to get all the details. So one of the interesting things, like, for example, websites. The technical guys, the technical buyers, they're going to dig in deep. They'll find everything. You don't need to put that front and center on the website. What you need front and center on the website is for this guy because he's not going to go much past the first page. He'll click twice, he's done. He, he's learned enough that he needs to learn about climas. He's moving on with his life. So you're an engineer, and you must never utter a word of engineering if you get a conversation with this guy, if you send him an email, if you talk to his secretary. Any indication that you're a technical guy gets you sent to this man. Once you talk to this man, you normally can't get back to anybody else because this guy feels it's his job to make sure he protects the rest of the company from making a bad decision. Right? So this is why what you find often is good salesmen don't know anything about technology. But what's amazing is when you, you take a look at them and you talk to them, you actually find out they typically know more. They know nothing, but they actually say even less to the customer, right? We know here, he knows here, but when he talks to the customer, he talks there. You're stupid already. Why are you exaggerating? And he's exaggerating. He's exaggerating because he doesn't want to meet this guy. He doesn't want to get trapped in that technical buyer. He doesn't want to get trapped in that conversation. He wants to talk about carpets and climas. He doesn't want to have a conversation about artificial intelligence, self-learning, corrective, thermal compensating zone algorithms. So we as engineers, it's really hard because our starting point's too damn high. And we have to completely turn all of that off. And when somebody says something that's Totally stupid. Like, you can't do that with Linux. Let's move on, right? Because if you, if you respond, then you're, you're back into this guy. So this is one of the things. So, so we, we start to see what the problems are, right? So, so again, we've got the problems of there's not one solution. We can't give the solution too early. And... Uh, we can't talk technical because we get trapped by the wrong people. The wrong decision makers are involved if we start talking technical. So actually what you find is when you do large-scale 
selling, what you often have is technical pre-sales. And their job is to be the sacrificial salesman for this guy. Go talk to him, make yourself, make him happy. Right? That's often what, what uh, the basic strategy is. So, um, okay, so now I want to go, so these are the basic components of what we need to sell. We need to get to the financial buyer. I need to be clear. I need to not get trapped by the technical buyer. I need to move forward. So let's do this the other way. We've come up with this great software, right? We have this software that's going to do fraud detection. Software for fraud, it's going to remove fraud completely. We've thought of it at home. We're about to go do a startup. So the first thing we need to do uh, is what happens. So we have a feature that detects if uh, a car buyer is a foreign citizen and is doing fraud. But as it turns out, my customer doesn't have that problem because he doesn't actually have any customers who are foreigners. How much is he willing to pay for that? Anybody else want to take a guess? Less. Here's why. Uh, if somebody says this product has 22 features and all you want is one feature, how much do you think you're paying for from a, from a buying perspective? Let's say somebody wanted to sell you a guidebook of the entire planet. A lonely planet for the lonely planet guide for the entire world. Every single thing there. But you can only use it for six months. It dissolves. So you're going to go take a holiday in New Zealand. Do you want my guidebook that has every single city in the world? Or do you want New Zealand cities? Even if the section is the same number of pages. Why? Because you don't believe for a second the quality's as good, do you? And number two is, you know you're paying for something that you didn't. You, you, there's no way, there's no such thing as free, is there? Even in software, there's no such thing as free. So it's going to add complexity. It's going to add quality problems. It's going to add stuff I don't want. I'm paying for it. I know it. There's just no way you're not, I'm not paying for it. So... When you show a customer a feature that he doesn't want, doesn't have, the, doesn't have the problem that matches that, the price goes negative. So typically as an engineer, one of our sort of thinking is we'll have a feature here, 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 and we'll just show them all to the customer and it'll be like a buffet and he'll find the stuff he likes. And he's going to think what a great restaurant this is. But he won't, right? Because all those other entrees in there, he just thought, what a sucky restaurant this is, and there were two decent things on the menu, and it's too bad that's not the only thing they cook. So that's the first rule. So if you're in sales and you've already built the product, what should you do? How do you know what they need, what their problems are? You can do some research, listening, asking. Yeah, that's research. So research engineers are good at research. Asking and listening, good engineering skill? Nope. <laughs> Got the answer, teacher. <laughs> listening. Listening is the key and asking the questions. What kind of question can you ask? You guys know the difference between an open and a closed question? Permission to, to interrogate the witness, right? This is, isn't it true that you did this, 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 right? This is, I ask you for, do you have this problem? Do you, how many customers do you have? What's your revenue? How many city locations are you? These are closed, hard questions. Open questions. These are things like, how do you handle fraud now? What's your customer makeup? Right? So these are questions that are open questions that get the customer to talk. Do engineers like open questions? Okay, so 
you guys need to learn how to do open questions, right? So you're going to have to ask open questions to discover the problem. Now we get into a little bit more psychology. Do customers want to tell you what their problems are? No. So if you ask them, do you have this problem? Do you have a venereal disease? What's their answer going to be? Nope. Next. So how do you get somebody to answer, to, to disclose their, their question? So again, this gets into the art of what a real salesman typically does. And they don't even know why they do it. But what you're basically doing is you're looking for what is... My favorite definition for a problem is the gap between the way it should work and the way it really works. So how does... How much fraud should you guys have in a given year? And how much fraud is there now? Uh-huh. So you do have a problem. That the customer will tell you. If, on the other hand, you say, do you have a fraud problem? Mm, no. Right? So do you see the difference in that, that? That's really subtle, but you get wildly different results. So engineers want to just go in for the kill. They want to ask, do you have a fraud problem? Mm, no. Okay, let me tell you about some more features. Okay, so first rule is, so should I give a presentation to the customer? I meet the customer, I'm here, should I give him my company presentation? Why are you dead? Sorry? Why are you dead? Uh, dead? I mean, if I bring up the PowerPoint, and let me show you slide six, here's the different things we do. What's going to happen? I'm showing them the buffet. I'm in trouble. I'm already starting in negative territory. I'm always going to have to, have to go back and explain why all those things he doesn't care about actually are not a big deal. All those chapters in my tour guide, not a problem. What we really concentrate on is New Zealand, trust me. So if you do a PowerPoint presentation, you got a problem. Your PowerPoint needs to come after the conversation, not before. So that means you can't prepare the way you want to prepare. You need to be more improvisational. And the key to improvisation, if you ask anybody who's good at improv, it's listening. It's not voices and characters, it's listening. So you need to listen and figure out what the customer wants. So problems that you solve that the customer doesn't have are negative. So you need to not expose those, and preferably in engineering, not build them. But, you know, engineers are crazy. They build lots of stuff we don't need. We'll live with that. The next thing is, do we have problems? Are all problems equal? No. So a great example, example I like to use is my watch. It's a pretty simple watch. I do a lot of traveling with time zones, and my watch doesn't do time zones. That's a problem for me. I'll agree. That's a problem. How much am I willing to pay? Anybody else have the same problem? That you travel in times, travel different time zones? Nobody? Not a single person here changes phones? Only a single function device. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Exactly. So why is this problem, how much, is it, how much am I willing to spend to fix this problem? And the answer is very little. It is a problem, but it's not big enough to be a need because, as you pointed out, we have phones. And the math is not so difficult because we're engineers <laughs> and we like to stay sharp. So I come up with this brilliant watch that's super cool. How much are people willing to pay? Just finding out that the customer has a time zone problem doesn't mean that it's big enough to be a need. So here's one of your, the next tips for you guys. Typically, people buy a product for one feature. There's one burning need that they have. So one burning benefit. So maybe there's actually two or three features that drive that one benefit. But there's typically, your product typically has four or five, if it was designed by engineers, 45 benefits. Uh, and typically, a customer is going to buy because of only one. Now, it may not be the same one for every customer, but it's typically only one. 
if there isn't one that's just the burning, desperate need to fix that, then they typically won't. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I've got twin boys, and uh, twin small boys. And by the time in my Mazda 6 I put the car seats in, these car seats are so safe, there's no room for a fifth person in the car. So if I go to buy a new car, my burning need is getting a fifth passenger inside the car. Everything else after that, yes, I would like something maybe more smooth. Maybe I would like something that gets better fuel economy. We can discuss all of these things. But there is one burning need that's going to trigger my purchase for a car. As it turns out, you can rent vans, so that's not even there. So in my case, I'm yet another person that has a problem without a need. So how do you find out needs? Customers confirmed he has the problem. How do you confirm a need? That this problem is big enough to be a need. Do you ask him? You ask, uh, what question. Yeah. What no, that's a conditional close. How do you find out if it's a burning need? Does the customer automatically know how big the problem is? Fraud in the bank, in the, in the insurance company. Do they know how big the problem is? Yeah, and since we're engineers, we're usually coming up with breakthrough ideas that are not coming in the normal way. So normally they're not looking for us directly. We're having to sell, educate them, bring a new concept. It's something they're not used to seeing. So I mean that in a good way, right? That's, that's cool. That's not negative. It just means that we're not selling yet another tire, right? It's not just, uh, it's not commodity. What we'll dream up, our passions, the things we want to sell, the things that would drive us to leave engineering and go to sales is not going to be selling yet another bottled water, right? It's going to be something more difficult, more world-changing, something that will get us to do that. So... The answer is implications. What happens if? What happens when? When you go traveling and you watch and you make, mistake the wrong time zone, what happens to the meetings? What kinds of meetings are they? They're with customers. Are customers easy to get? No, they're not. Right? So now all of a sudden we start to build the story of what's the... What's the consequences of not fixing the problem? Right? We all in our lives, as we said, we got 10 pages of things. Page one is the only one we even do personally also. So how do you get on page one? You get on page one because there's an urgent benefit you need. How do you know which one is that? It's because you've, you've said the words out of your mouth about all the consequences that problem is causing. Is that clear? Okay. No, you don't see by the reaction. They have to say it in, from their mouth. It has to come from their mouth. You cannot say, so this is causing problems with salesmen and with customers and everything else. This problem's huge. No, that doesn't count. That's not real. You put words in his mouth, he's going to say it just to be Mr. Nice to you. First rule is sales. Obviously, the best customer is a customer who says yes. Who's the worst customer? Mr. Nice. Oh, you guys are great. I really liked what it is. Maybe you could send me some more information. Mr. Nice, full of encouragement. He's the worst customer because they waste your time. Right? So you want a clear yes, you want a clear no. And what happens is if you put the words into his mouth, there's high risk that he becomes Mr. Nice. Burning needs have to be real. If they're not real, 24 hours later, they're not going to be there. They're hard enough to keep there. Even when the words come out of his mouth, five days later, he's often forgotten, and you have to remind him. We're not trying to sell chewing gum. We're trying to stalk down and get a customer to do what's in his best interests and buy something great and revolutionary and important. And if he doesn't have the need, then we pick the wrong guy, and it's time to move on. He's just, you know, 
Here's our business card. Call us when things change. That's it. What about making a fraud? Any business was a fraud? You, uh, yeah. So in that case, you could make a fraud and telling him it's a fraud. So you could scare the shit out of him. So that would work really good for something impulsive. If the price was low enough, you would sell it instantly. But if the price is high and you need multiple decision makers, that fear is going to drop off. And especially if they start to think about alternative ways they might do something. So the, the, the danger is you, you don't want to shock and awe. They need to actually say it out of their mouth. So you could, you could, but they need to say it. They need to feel it. And the problem is you getting through, can anybody else? Maybe. Yeah? Okay. So, need is the killer. One need, one benefit. So when you make your product, you know, when you do something like uh, launch a new product or do a startup, you're typically trying to come up with one benefit that's going to be the killer benefit. And you try and pick your customers so tight, so narrow at the beginning that you can just find those guys and those are your first customers. That's one of the, the, the first keys to doing any startup. You start with one and only one benefit, if at all possible. And same thing with a new product launch. So you create, try and do everything you can not to have the buffet. So the next thing is, so let's say that I agree. Let's say I say it out of my mouth. That is a definite need. What's the next problem? If it's a need, I mean, you already know that, he's, that he should be willing to pay a lot. And hopefully you've got a great value product, so that's hopefully not going to be such a problem. But what else is going to be a problem? So he didn't even realize he had this need. Suddenly he discovers the need, like you just did an a intrusion detection. The next thing is typically, what would a perfect world look like? How would I know if I solved the problem? So not, how would I know if your technology works? No. How would I know if I really solved my problem? How would I know if I couldn't have fraud? Or how would I know that I have a acceptably low levels of fraud? Is it possible to measure that? Is it possible to imagine it? What does it look like? What does it feel like? So that I can compare completely alternatives, right? So my watch, we can come up there and say, yeah, time zones, this is really screwing me up. I'm missing critical meetings, and it's way out of proportion. This is ridiculous that I don't fix it. But now once I define the problem, my phone works just fine for solving that problem. So even if you convinced me that this is critical, my phone's probably an equally good solution. But if I don't have that clear in my head, I'm not sure I'm ready to buy a watch, right? Because I know I, need, I have the need, but I'm not sure what I have the need for. And just because you're the smartest guy in the room and you've proved it with this great technology, I'm not ready to go with you. So what you have to do is get me to picture, me as the customer, you need to get me to picture a perfect world. So we have to agree on what the problem is. We have to agree the problem is big enough to be a need, that it's urgent, big, burning business problem, one. And we have to agree on what a perfect world is. If we have those three things, how much do I need to disclose about my product to get those first three things? Sorry? Only as much because the customer doesn't want to talk to you. He's, don't you guys have a product? Can't you tell me a little bit about what you have? As little as possible. You know who knows too much? Engineers. Salesmen know too little about the product, and it is a great advantage. Because if you lined up those three problems, if you know what were the problems that he has, which one of those problems is an urgent critical need and the customer agrees, and what a perfect world might look like, which would be the evaluation criteria, by the way, that you're going to be compared to. He knows what he needs to submit to win the deal. So, but the key was he couldn't talk about the product. What happens if you talk about the product while you do that? Yep. 
What else? Are you trustworthy? Is this an honest conversation we're having about my problems if you're starting to tell, show me your solution? You know, it sure looks like you're trying to squeeze and brainwash me into, into this particular solution. So one of the things I should do if I'm a good salesman is I should actually ignore what product I sell. I should only be thinking about it in terms of, is this the right customer or not the right customer? You know, should I walk away now or should I continue the conversation and maybe walk away later? But if I get to the end, yeah, we can help this customer quite a bit. This is the right customer. I'm good. But if you're an engineer and you love the technology, you often want to become the advocate. You know, you ever seen the guy, the salesman, who wants to defend his product? Can you, can you defend your product? Can you argue with the customer? You can argue with the customer. The question is, is, is it possible to win that argument? You guys are smart engineers, right? You want, I see this all the time with engineers. You want to have that argument because you know the product and you know the technology and the customer is just such an idiot. Will you win? You can't win. He's the judge also. He defines the rules. You cannot argue a customer into buying something. That's one of the, 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 the first things that doesn't happen. Logic, debating, this is not a debate. Again, because it's relative, right? It's not absolute. You cannot win the debate. Not only is he the judge, but also... The competition is not an absolute, it's relative. There's not even one judge, there's multiple judges. So you've lost. Once you start arguing, you're done, you've finished. So present your product when? Late, late, late in the conversation, as late as possible. What should be on your website? If you're doing the kinds of selling that needs a meeting, nobody's going to not, not, uh, nobody's going to order online. What should be on your website? Schedule a meeting. Schedule a meeting, but what about the, the details of your product? How much, how much information should you have? What are you selling on a website if you need a meeting to sell? No, keep going. No, not a solution. You're selling a meeting. All you want the customer to buy is a meeting. Yes, I'm curious enough for the meeting. You are going to intentionally not put things on the website that should be there so that they ask you about them. If you put the information there, if you hand me the brochures of the tractors, will I come back to Domjale? No, I don't think I have a reason to. Can we have a conversation about my problems if I already think I know everything? No. And this is what happens. The customer already thinks he knows everything. He's psychologically in a bad place where he's actually self-destructive. And now an engineer comes in who thinks he knows everything and is, loves the product. This is a train wreck. This is why engineers are horrible, horrible salesmen because you have to change that. So the first things you've got to do is sell the next step, listen, don't talk about your product, Get the customer to understand what his own problems are and what his needs are and figure out, help him figure out a framework to decide. And then, only then, are you in a situation where you want to present and try and close a deal. So. But they don't trust you if you have a lousy web page with no information. I didn't say a lousy web page, and I didn't say no information. So, when I went to the tractor store, if I said, how much is this? What would happen if he said, why don't we talk? Or why don't you tell me about your problems? What's going to happen? I'm not going to tell him about my problems. <laughs> I asked him how much this cost. I expect a straight answer, right? You've got to give him a straight answer. Nobody's, you know, be amazing salesman if he could just 
move me, but I'm an engineer. I focus, right? I want to know how much that damn thing costs. So what are you going to do? You've got to tell them how much it costs. You, you, say the price. you give them a cost. You give them one of many costs, right? What you want to do is have six cost conversations, six technical detail conversations. Why? Because this is a long process, and in between answering his questions, he answers my questions. Right? I've got several different models, but first I need to know. So, several different models. The first one starts at 18,000 euros. But first, tell me, how big is your vineyard? Right? We start a couple closed questions. And what's your experience in farming? Oh, yeah. Okay. Good, good. Yes. Yes, it does have a diesel engine. And you move into, and have you ever used a driven a tractor before? Do you want to use something else for this? Do you want another use for the tractor? So having that conversation, you have to answer direct questions, but the trick is to answer them as many times. So if I put the price on my website and download the, TDF, the, the PDF technical details, what do I need? Nothing. I don't need a conversation. It's commodity. So as long as I have great pricing and it's clear what I do and somebody can evaluate it, fine. As soon as the technical buyer can buy it, you're fine. So if you want to buy resistors for a circuit board, the purchasing guys can buy that. They know what the specs are. They can, they can compare them. It's fine. Anybody not believe what I'm saying? Anybody brave enough to say this doesn't sound right? Okay. Talking in front of a Slovene audience, it's so hard. Um, so let's do a couple others. Um, so rules for selling. So we, we talked about why do engineers need to sell? We need to sell because we want to build things. And if you want to build things and change the world, somebody needs to buy it. And we said that if you're going to build that company, a couple rules. Sales is going to cost more money than developing it. And number two, it can't be outsourced. We've got we to gotta be involved somehow, one way or the other. Getting a technical founder is going to help that a lot, but we're going to be tightly integrated into that process. So we have no choice, and we have everything working against us. So the first things we have to do is be stupid. We don't know what's going on, right? We're engineers. We walk into the customer and say, ah, they must have a process problem. I have this great process tool. Right, because that's what engineering often is, right? It's a, it's a mechanical tool that solves a repetitive problem. I have the weapon that solves that particular process problem. The first thing is the customer doesn't even necessarily know he has a process. And his process may not be your process, what you thought the process is. So you have to walk in with the assumption that you know nothing and the customer knows nothing. And this is where charm helps a little bit and alcohol so dinners work much better than formal meetings because to not know anything and to let the customer not know anything requires a little bit of safety and a little bit of time. Um, and that's difficult. So one of the things you have to do while you're selling is you have to be wowing them with, we've got all this great stuff, but let me ask you this question. You always have to be feeding him enough that, he, that you maintain his interest while you're asking the questions. So, first rule of engineer selling. Disclose as little as possible about your product as, as you can. And especially things like price and technical details, you want to meter, figure out ways you can meter this out multiple times. So, for example, price. Right? We talked about the tractor. So we can say, here's the list price. That can be your first answer. Here's the, but I need to know how much you're going to buy and which version we need. Ah, uh -huh. here's the version you need. But I still need to know more about uh, if we might be able to find a different compromise on some of the versions. And, you know, I'm again looking for reasons for discounting. And again, we might have some special actions and I might be able to get you into it a little bit better. 
or again, we might be able to do something as a cross-reference. You as a reference customer, I might be able to make you, uh, uh, get you even, into even a better price. Can't guarantee it, but let's just, let's have a conversation and see if this would work. So you're coming up with reasons to extend that conversation. Um, number two, you don't know anything. That's why you need to talk to this guy. You want to know about business. You want to know about their business. You want to know about their prob how they operate. And you want to be part of the solution. You need to be credible enough that you're there to help them, but not so credible that you think that it appears as if the answer is in your head. If, they think, if the customer thinks you've already got the answer in their head, they're not going to talk to you anymore because the negotiation started. Right? Does that make sense? We have a a discovery part, and we have a negotiation part. As soon as the customer thinks that you've already got the answer in your head, we've entered into that second stage. And that's a defensive stage. Um, features the customer can't use, negative. Not zero, negative. You've got to hide them from them. Uh, finding the burning need. If there's no burning need, What's the price? I have no burning need for a watch with time zone. What's the correct price for a watch with time zones? One euro. Maybe not even the effort of picking out a new watch. It's low. If you have a problem selling at whatever price point you picked, most likely it's because your customer doesn't have a burning need for the benefit that you're selling. You picked slightly the wrong customer or you've got slightly the wrong benefits for that customer, or that customer doesn't recognize that he has the need because he didn't get it clean in his head. And again, you can't tell the customer. The customer has to figure that out. Uh, and sort of my last rule for selling, if you're a, an engineer, is you have to get past the technical guy. The one guy who understands you, who feels for you, who respects you, who likes you. You can't talk to him at the party. You've got to move past him. You've got to get to the right guy. And the right guy's down here, the financial buyer. So that's basically the main key point. So let's talk about a couple other things. Uh, manipulation. You guys know what manipulation is, right? Salesmen do these things. You get the hard pressure, sell tricks, all these different things they do. What's the difference between manipulation and good sales? Yeah, in many ways. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? Ethics. Yeah, ethics. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I would say the difference is intent, right? Black art, black magic versus white magic, white hat hacking versus black hat hacking. What's the difference? It's intent. Are you using it for good or are you using it for evil? If this is what the customer needs and the customer is having one of those psychological burps and can't pull it across the line and pull the trigger then using all these dirty tricks that you find in the books, as far as I'm concerned, is ethically completely okay. But this is both rare, and it only will work a little bit. So having these weapons in your pockets useful, but actually it's also dangerous, because you might want to use it too early and too much. And once, you, once the customer sees that you have them, once they feel them, then it's a problem. So again, you want to be like one of those martial artists who just sort of cool and laid back and hands in his pocket. You want to know you have it, but you don't want to use it. So that's the trick to manipulation. So we talked about things like negotiations. When do you have a negotiation problem with price? What are the situations where you have a price problem? Yell them out. Let me just write them down. When do you have a price problem? What, what situations create a price problem? What does that mean? How 
How's that different from need not big enough? Well, actually, yeah, perceived value. Great. What does that mean? No, no, no. What does it mean if they don't have the money? Does it mean they have no money? No money's going to anybody? No money's going to you. What does that mean? No money's going to Klimas. Means you are not a priority, which means you have low perceived value and the need's not big enough. Right? That's basically when you hear that story, that's it. What's the other time that you hear that story? Oh, uh, we don't have budget for that. What does that mean? It can be somebody who just wants to lower the price. Who wants to lower the price? It can be an ego game, yeah. But have you already decided at that point? I mean, by the time you start negotiating price for a car, come on, are you really walking away? No. You've fallen in love with that car. The salesman knows it. And he's fallen in love with you. You're going to get the deal. Right? You both have agreed that you're going to finally buy that BMW 1 Series that you read about in the magazine and thinks is so cool. He knows it. You know it. And you both are just there doing a little dance. But that's going to work itself through. That's not, winning that's just ego. You know, that's small. Because none of, neither one of you is going to be so stupid to walk away. That's just, that'll just take a little time to work out. And both of you will do okay. The, the bigger danger is somebody walks away. Why did they walk away? That was more than ego. That was, they didn't understand something. They had a psychological burp. That's, that's a much bigger problem. So when somebody says we don't have the budget, who are you talking to? Which of the buyers? Financial, user, or, or technical buyer? We don't have the budget. Who set the budget? So if we don't have the budget, you're not talking to the financial buyer because he's the guy who wrote the budget. And of course he can put the budget there, right? He put the budget at 12000 he can put the budget at 20000 It's his budget. So not having the budget from a financial buyer is just empty words, or it's from somebody who's not the financial buyer, and you got trapped by Mr. Technical. Because he was told you have a budget of 12000 and his job is to squeeze you down so it fits within 12000 because he wants to be a hero within the company. So... That's, so the, the, when somebody starts talking about budget, that's, yeah. Oh, we're running low on time. Good. Uh, good. I, I wanted to point out, basically, if you're, yep. You said, you know, he's trying to be a hero in the company. Mm-hmm. User buyers can. It's, it's, it's much more rare because they're usually sort of cut out of the process. They're, they're more disruptors because they're not, they think they should be involved and they were so cut out that if they get included at all, they're typically pretty excited. Uh, just as a general rule. It's the technical buyers, they're engineers again, right? So they're, they're thinking absolute, they're thinking there's a perfect answer. They're, they're going to find the right solution for the company. They're going to find that perfect mathematical answer. Yeah. Absolutely. So you break it down to we have a financial buyer, a user buyer, and a technical buyer. And these are typically in different divisions of a company. And then you have the motivations of that team or that tribe. And then you have the motivations of that individual. So they got it, they get Miller Hyman wrote fantastic. There's, there's a whole Miller Hyman uh, approach to this complex consultative selling that basically breaks down. And you go through each person in the decision process and you figure out what's his personal win and what's the team's win. And then you try and satisfy that, right? Because a need, 
A need for the financial buyer is not a need for the technical buyer and vice versa. Technical buyer wants to make sure this is compatible with his Oracle database. Financial buyer is trying to figure out how we can get both the clima and the carpets. So, you know, what's important changes. So, if, if you're selling a pro protection, mm -hmm. something from product to trigger, and, and you have okay, managed to um, go around the technical buyer, so right. you still may have to talk to the current pro protection team and so on and do a evaluation of like, what the ROI would be. And so on. Right. So fraud detection is an issue. So fraud detection is, is kind of interesting because you might have a fraud team or you might not have a fraud team. And so it might be the financial uh, director might be the one who's in terms of, of trying to reduce that sort of thing. So you typically have a technical buyer, which would be the IT department, but they're never going to be able to say yes. So it could be the actuarial. It could be the people processing claims. It could be a fraud detection group if they have it. It could be the financial director. It could be the CEO. You don't know, and that's part of going in and asking questions. So a great trick, I'll just throw out one more thing, which is uh, who else is involved in the decision? That's how you ask the question to find out if, if you know who all the buyers are. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you just, just yeah, time. Uh, so I just wanted to go into... From a salesman, typically if I'm actually training a salesman, one of the things I challenge them to do, which is, if you lose on price, there's only three reasons I can think of why a salesman loses on price. Number one, the, you went to the customer that doesn't have the problem. You wasted sales time chasing the wrong customer. And you lost on price because the customer didn't need the value you were selling. So that's step number one. It's the salesman's fault. You were targeting the wrong customer. Number two, the customer didn't recognize the value. He needs it. He should, be, he should want it, but he didn't recognize the value. Again, from my perspective, that's a salesman's fault. He's got to get to the right people and have the right conversations to be able to do that. He's got to be able to do that. And then the third is, my product doesn't compare well to the competition. The value for money sucks. It's not different than the others. It's just less good. In that case, I'm working for the wrong company, and it's time to change who I sell for. All three, if you lose on price, it's the salesman's fault, as far as I'm concerned. It's the sales team's fault to figure out what it is. So as you make your jump, just... Think that through in your head. And if you do, that does two things. It forces you to stop chasing stuff that's a bad fit. That takes tons and tons of energy to chase things that have a bad fit. And it also forces you to come up with new ways to move the, the right fit forward. And with that, I think we'll stop. Guys, good luck in making your transition to the dark side of the force. I hope you enjoy it. It's, it is okay. You get a lot more drinking and a lot more... Women are involved in sales than in engineering, but I still miss engineering. Thanks. did just that, right? So the first thing is stop doing the things that get you in trouble, right? Stop doing that and becoming, become, no, become no worse than a secretary trying to sell. If you can just get to that point, you will develop skills. Engineers are fast learners, but you've got to stop doing the things that are counterproductive because you just won't, won't get there. So stop coming up with the answer as quickly as possible to the one person who understands. Walk away with nothing other than that. You'll, you're 50% of the way there. Um, how do you comment when normally when salespeople go around, normally they sell something that the product doesn't do, and then engineers have to work overnight, and we love salesmen. So i got to tell you, come to the dark side. It's great. <laughs> uh, no, it, it's... 
it's because usually customers are asking for something else or need something else. And that means you either targeted the wrong customer or your product is not right. I don't know. One says you should fire the salesman. One says you should fire the guy who's designing the product, the product manager. I don't know, but something's not in line. And it's really important you get that straightened out between those. I mean, Look, I mean, what is iterative design? What is, you know, lean startup? Of course you should sell it before it's built. You guys are good engineers. I mean, I'm, I'm just amazed. We, we, we've got, you know, there are things that you may or may not be able to do. But there are relatively limited number of things that you'll never be able to do, that you'll never be able to solve. It's just a question of degree of difficulty. But whether the customer is going to buy or not buy, whether this thing's going to bring value to them, this is much more complex, much more uncertain, and much more difficult. So the idea that I must always prepare and have everything built and tested and, and certified and homologated before I ever let a customer see it, a la Steve Jobs, come on, this, this is not reality. This is what happens is you build f benefits that customers don't want, and the salesmen are spending all their time trying to explain why your field guide for, why your Lonely Planet guide is this big. That's the danger. That's the danger the other way, which is if you build it first and then you sell it, you build stuff that customers don't value and it carries negative, not positive. You can. I mean, sometimes it works if you're really charming. Uh, I'm not that charming. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, charm works, right? So this is why stupid, good-looking salesmen are able to do amazing things. <laughs> but, uh, but also, stupid, ugly salesmen do amazing things. So, but you have to tell them as little as possible. Can you give an example? So I want to sell fraud detection. You would call up and say, look, I'm interested in having a meeting talking about how you guys might be able to improve fraud, and I want to just talk about benchmarking and what you guys are doing in fraud and maybe how this compares to other companies I'm talking to. I want to get his curiosity. It's the same thing you'd use to get a date, right? What do you tell them? I'm a good-looking guy. I've got a great company. Let me show you. Here's the model car I have. I still live with my mother, but I have this. No, you don't list all of that. You tell just enough to get the first date. When you're trying to get the meeting, it's the exact same thing. Another great thing engineers are great at dating, right? Um, sales is more like dating than like gaming. <laughs> have I sold any fraud detection systems? Uh, I mean, I've, I've been involved in products that were in that space, yeah. Can you sell the product at G-Club? Uh, at Hermes Soft Lab, yes, we did. We were part of that consortium with, uh, with uh, OptiLab. And not to, tri not to Triglau, to uh, the consortium yeah. of insurance companies. Triglau, OptiLab's, OptiLab bought that directly. I oh, you are, okay. So it was really good examples. Um, I got the impression that uh, you wanted to talk about business to business. Yeah. And a lot of your examples were business to customer. Uh, what's, what's the main thing? Because you were talking yeah. about... Uh, so business... So complex consultative selling is the, the largest, most difficult. If you can manage that, everything's easier. So services are harder to sell than products, right? Because you can't compare the specifications. Uh, large complex is more difficult to sell than small simple, small simple commodity. And also unbranded is more difficult to sell than branded, right? People recognize the brand versus you have a brand nobody heard of. Uh, high quality, high quality in price is more difficult, premium price quality is more difficult to sell than great value for money. So these are all the, the differences. In B2C, you often have a lot more impulsive. You have a lot, you can shorten it. It gets much more simple. 
right? So you typically only have, you have a much smaller organization. There's, uh, uh, you know, there's really only two characters in B2C, right? It's the guy and his wife or the guy and his brother, uh, the guy and his father. It's, it's pretty simple what those relationships are, while in B2B, it's much more complex. So I often use B2C because people understand it if they haven't. If you've worked in small companies, often a B2B political problem you don't understand, but a B2C you would. But so what I'm talking about is the big, you know, we used some of these techniques, for example, Biznode, who does uh, Ebon and Boniteta telesales. You can use the same concepts, but you just have to shrink them all down to a five-minute phone conversation. It's really hard, but you can't, but it's the same steps. Do you have a problem? Does your problem big enough to be a need? What, how would you know whether it works? Let's close the deal. Here's what I've got, let's close the deal. And Biznode, Ebon or Bonitete, you've got 18,000 features. The key is not to explain 17,995 of them and only talk about the five that would really do great for them. So a Biznode or Ebon, if you ever get a call, they'll typically only talk about three or four features, max, 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 if they're good. Yep. There's a thesis that um, all buying decisions are emotionally driven. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. And what happens is, this is the other thing about engineers. We think we're not emotional. We think we're rational. And we think when we're emotional, we then go... We make sure that we have the checks because we're rational, and, and we're not. And, and I can explain architecture differences. God, you get horrible fights over, you know, should it be this architecture or this architecture? How did that happen? That's an emotional impulse. You were emotionally committed to that. Or what kind of car you drive. Did you test drive every car that's out there? Of course you didn't. You test drove one. You fell in love with that from the damn magazine or whatever it was. So... What I want to point out is you guys think you're not rational. You guys think that you're rational. You think you're Spock from Star Trek, but you're not. You're bones. And everybody sees it but you. And, and, and because we don't think we are, we also don't see it in others because we don't reflect it in others. So our customers are irrational. So they do things like they make an emotional response and then they justify it with logic, right? I want this architecture. And then I justify why I want that architecture. I want that BMW, and then I justify why I needed that BMW. Anybody else? Guys, thanks. <laughs>